Well, hi, my name's Kim. Thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I know we did a couple introductions, but as we go through, I'd love to hear more about you. Feel free to raise your hand, engage, interact. We'll have a lot of fun. Um, I gave you all uh, a couple things. One is this little handout. Um, I think everyone learns and listens in different ways. So to make a full 360 learning experience, you've got a little handout that you can follow along, fill in the blank, take some notes. And then you also have this little worksheet. Um, so I'll reference this in the talk and we'll, we'll go through it a little bit. Um, but this is your to keep. And then you'll also get copies of the presentation and digital copies of these as well. Yay. OK, cool. Well, let's get started. The seven secrets, how to harness the soul of your brand for the future of your company. So I'm just kind of curious, who here feels like you're a part of this massive influx of change where it's just unrelenting, not stopping, whether you're a part of it or you're a victim to it. Do you feel, you feel it happening? Yes? Okay. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you feel, because we're at 1871, do you feel like you're an active part of it, you're driving the change, or do you feel a little bit more uh, <laughs> like the change is driving you? Who feels like you're an active part of the change? And who feels, and you could actually, it could be both. The change is driving you. Both, yeah. It depends, <laughs> depends on the day, the hour. Yeah. <laughs> and who would love to know the future of your brand and how to harness it? Right? I think we all would love to know the future. Absolutely. So today we're going to talk about the seven secrets, really how to harness the soul of your brand for the future of your company. And what does that mean? Um, you know, through my career, both with small businesses, large enterprises, I've learned a lot over the last 15 years about what works and what doesn't work to really differentiate and stand out from what's becoming increasingly commoditized industries. I think across the board now, we're seeing commoditization take place really in every vertical. And so what makes these secrets unique that we're going to talk about today and really empower you to take advantage of is that they're tried and tested across the board. So there's a lot of gimmicks out there uh, that sound really good in theory, but you try them and you're like, this doesn't make sense. I posted to social media every day and nothing happened. Or someone, some really smart person did this one incredible thing with this great big company and they wrote a book and they have a TED talk, but it's a unicorn and it doesn't apply to anybody else. So these I put together because they actually work <laughs> <laughs> and they scale across the board. So you'll adapt them to you, and we'll talk about different examples and how you can apply it. Um, and I looked into some of the companies in the room, so feel free, we'll, we'll be interactive. But the goal is that these are applicable, they work, they're not unicorns, and they're not beautiful in academic theory, and then totally break down in practice. Great. OK, so secret number one. We're in this really interesting shift from the digital age to the human age. And what does that mean? So I was actually looking up some statistics, and I'm sure you all are probably aware of this too. Social media usage in the last couple of years, and specifically in the last year, has started declining um, almost by 10%, depending on the demographic you're looking at. So millennials and younger, uh, I think, have decreased almost 12%. Facebook overall has seen a drop of about 8%. Now those are you know, measurable decreases. There's also people like me who have made an active effort to stop logging on. So I probably don't show up in those stats, but there's a lot of folks that are making that active effort to pull back. So that's one example of the shift that we're seeing from digital to human. 15 years ago, and actually almost 18 years ago, we saw this massive influx of technology, right? Google acquired this little company called YouTube that had one video. You know, Yahoo was looking at acquiring this little company called Google, and they weren't sure if it made sense or not. So we go from this era of just massive explosion of technology and change and development, and we all did it all because you didn't really know what else you could do. It was digital for the sake of digital. It was new, it was novel, and it was exactly what we should have done then. What's happened is we've all learned. We've evolved as human beings, as a culture. I would call it a global culture. And we're really looking at digital as an enabler to us connecting with each other the way that it was intended to be versus digital for the sake of digital. So when all these technologies were created, the whole point was to bring us together. And I'm sure you all feel this. It's almost that we're, we're feeling farther apart. 
And so this cultural movement, the shift that we're feeling, is using digital as a way to create and facilitate human connections versus digital for the sake of digital and massive adoption because it's so new. So a couple examples of this, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we're seeing celebrities start adopting flip phones again. They're not getting rid of their smartphones. They still have them. There's just a time and a place for it. And flip phones are coming back because when you're out with your friends, you, you just need it to send a text message or make a call. You don't need a massive computer in your purse or in your pocket. And so again, we're looking at people really changing their digital usage to say, I don't need all of this all the time. I need it to help me do something. We're seeing the massive influx of applications that are really for your well-being. Apps that, you're, that people are actually purchasing to help them not use their phones. Digital, um, or excuse me, one of the leaders at Google is creating this whole suite of wellness applications within Google. So how do you disconnect? He went on vacation with his wife, didn't use his phone for, I think, a week, and walked away and said, that was really good. How do I, at Google, help people use our products but in healthy, meaningful ways? And so we're seeing this shift occur. So what this means for companies now and moving into the future is that it's really about knowing who you are and about mission and connections. So really, and, and I talk to a lot of my clients about this when I do work, you don't have to do everything for everything anymore. And so there's this massive change to say, this is what's right for me because this is what drives that purpose and that outcome for my customers or the people I'm trying to connect with versus I need to be here because I need to be here. And that seems like a very small nuanced change but it's a significant shift that's happening around the world and it has massive business implications. And we'll talk about those throughout this hour, but this is a big one that I wanted to call out because it's happening again across the world, across cultures. Secret number two, uh, the new marketing mix model is centrally human. And what does that mean? So I, I don't know if y'all are familiar with marketing mix models a little bit. It's kind of a jargon word. <laughs> so. Before there was multi-channel, you had TV, print, radio. So then we got into cross-channel. Cross-channel really was when the web was introduced. So you could have a TV ad to drive to a search engine to search for a product that would take you to the website, right? Channels crossing with each other. And then there was that whole wave of omni-channel. Has everyone heard of omni-channel? Super, yeah. You just have to be everywhere for everyone all the time. So in case they look for you, you need to be there. So every channel, all the time, hyper-connected. Um, honestly, people are still talking about this. Brands are still trying to do this. I think it's completely unrealistic. Um, and what we're seeing, again, with this human-centric change is that it's not about the channel. It's about who you are. And so as we move into this new human era, what we're finding is people really tapping into their humanity again. And these value systems of being authentic, transparent, and genuine are coming back into play. We saw these three areas really start in about 2012-2013. Um, authenticity, uh, simplicity, and transparency. So transparency really a result of a hacker movement. The idea that if you're not going to tell me who you are, I can find out. <laughs> the internet and the digital age has let it be so I can see the code behind your website. I can see you know, if you're not being an honest company, someone's going to make that apparent to me. Simplicity started coming through really in the food movement, right? We want simple ingredients. We want to know where it's coming from. And that bled into transparency. So what's interesting is those three trends didn't come and go in waves like we typically see. Really, across the last hundred years, there was a massive wave of change, and then it moved on. These started, and they're not going away. They actually layered on each other. So now we have these cultural expectations on each other to be transparent. We hear authentic all the time, be your authentic self. Right? We raised our kids to, to love being geeks or being someone that stands out or embracing yourself. Well, that's coming through now as a massive cultural change. The connection of the world through the internet allows us to see different people and celebrate it. And then being simple. Um, one, just a reaction, I think, of the overcomplexity, and especially when you think about you know, our food, um, the overcomplexity of that, but also a reaction to the recession. So as people were laid off, as a lot of people started their own businesses, 
How do you get back to basics and really create niche markets or do one thing really well? So this idea of simplicity. What makes this interesting for you all is that these are very human, personal words that we also apply to companies. So for the really the first time in history, we are now having a really personal human expectation on a non-human entity. <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. And if you think about your expectations on companies and brands, they probably align with this. I want to know if you're being environmentally friendly as a, as a corporation. So in the last eight years, we've seen corporations that have reported their missions and the work that they do, the philanthropic work they do outside of their corporate profits to Wall Street. That's a massive change. You go from hardly any corporations, really the Patagonias of the world, to now everybody's doing it. Doesn't affect your, your, your profit margins, but we care and we wanna see it and that shift is happening. And so what really makes this unique, and this is where your, your little workbook comes into play, is that as you build your businesses or as you're running them, you now have the expectation, not as owners or leaders at your company to be this yourself, but your brands have to be this. How do you show an authentic brand? It's not, re it's not a person, but you've got to create these really person identities behind the products that you sell, the services that you provide, and the brand that you are. Um, does that make sense? So that's the next secret. And we talk about, in here, I'll go over this side. We, I talk about the brilliance review, and I'll just do this really quickly. So what I provided you is this workbook to really kind of help unpack that, because that's a pretty big challenge. Um, what is your mission? What is your vision? How does it translate to a marketplace? How do you create this kind of really deep emotional sense with a customer when you you're selling potentially a commodity or a service or a good and you're exchanging money. Um, and yet you're also supposed to be this warm, fuzzy person to them. And so in the workbook I created, it, it really just helps you walk through what I call your brand brilliance assessment. So who is your brand as a person? Identifying your customer as an entire person. And then the value that you bring to them in that one moment of their life that you have that intersection. The same way that human beings, you know, we walk in the room, I'm only in your life for an hour, right? Maybe we follow each other on social and it becomes like an hour and a couple seconds every ran <laughs> randomly every couple months. It's very similar to our customers. We're this much in their lives. So how do you make sure that they really feel the power of your brand, that, authentic that authenticity, that clear focus? when you've only got them for a minute and when it really matters to them. And so the takeaway here is one, this is not gonna change. This is actually gonna get more and more powerful. When you've got every option to choose from and every brand is the same, you're gonna start making decisions based on the value system that brand holds, how they make you feel, and that personal identity that's attached to it. And so really making sure as your company grows or you're starting to just become more mature in the marketplace or deal with additional competitors, do you know who you are first? So your customer, absolutely you need to know them, but who are you? When you walk in that room, do you know your identity? And so really doing that work and feeling comfortable with it because it's gonna become more and more important over the years. I want to tell you a story. These are a couple brands that I think do it really well. So I'll kind of walk through examples because this is very, I don't know if esoteric is the right word, <laughs> but this idea of being be authentic and transparent and simple. So um, I, Special K, I would recommend, I'm not going to show you the video today, but if you have seen the Special K We Eat commercial, has anyone seen that? It's awesome. So just YouTube Special K We Eat. Um, it's one of their new commercials on TV. and it's about women doing all the great things that they do because they eat food. So you think about a cereal brand, <laughs> one of, that, how many in the aisle? Thousands, right? And now they're going up against organic cereals and locally grown cereals and we're sourcing them from your backyard cereals. So Special K, owned by a big CPG, how do they stand out? They celebrate the fact that they're food and embrace it. Yeah, we're food. We help women eat. We help women eat so they can have babies. We help women eat so they can work two jobs 
and build their own businesses. And so what a cool way to say, how do we not try to save the world with cereal, <laughs> but really embrace who we are as a food product to talk about how we really connect with that customer in that moment of their life, which is when they're eating, whether it's a breakfast bar or in the car on the go or cereal in the morning. The other story um, I'll tell you about really quickly is this, this tequila brand. So I was in a bar um, on Randolph Street. I can't think of the name. And so we're sitting in this bar on Randolph Street and an older couple, so you know, maybe 50s, walks over and sits next to us. And they asked the bartender, what tequila do you recommend? And the bartender says, well, ob I mean, obviously I've got like 50 tequilas. And I, this is a true story. But I got to tell you, I recommend this one. Because these people come in every time they drop off a distribution and they tell me all about how their agave plants are grown. And did you know that when they're growing in Mexico, there's this huge issue with corporate tequila brands where they're actually creating deforestation issues, where they're demolishing natural habitats to really you know, productize the creation of the plants that drive this product. It's like, but this company's different. They grow them in a way that's sustainable to the environment. They make sure they plant additional plants if they have to remove them. They're incredible in the community. And every time they come and drop off this tequila, they tell me about what they're doing in Mexico and how they're helping the environment. And I just, I, I love working with them. I love the mission that they're doing. And I, I recommend this tequila. That's, that's a, a centrally human brand. That person walked in and they told their story. How are we different? Well, they care about the environment and they're, they're helping add value to that bartender who does have to stand in front of customers every day and try to pick out a tequila, again, what, hundreds? <laughs> and how, much, how different do they really taste? So that's another example of understanding what makes you different and then bringing that to the market, knowing that your customers will, will appreciate it. The final story I'll tell you is about we. Have you guys heard, have you tried this new yogurt from YoPlay? So Greek yogurt's been around now for a while, probably almost 10 years. I'm terrible with dates. So Greek yogurt came into the market, completely disrupted it. If you really think about the sweet yogurts that we had and then Greek yogurt comes out, YoPlay was floored. Just absolutely floored. How do people like this thing? It's tart, it tastes totally different. We have all these sweet, sugary, fruity yogurts and we can't compete. Their market started tanking. And they spent years trying to figure out how to compete with this changing cultural trend towards independent, employee run, came out of nowhere, weird name, Greek yogurts, right? Years trying to test new markets, test new names, test new products. What if we tried this fruit? What if we tried it this way? They came up with you know, names that they thought sounded, you know, just as exotic and none of them worked. So finally they went back and they looked at what their, where their yogurt came from. So YoPlay was acquired by General Mills in, you know, the mid 2000s, so I think like 2011. And before that it was a French company. And it was really started when a bunch of independent farms merged in the 60s in France. And they had this incredible, I mean, these are dairy farmers in the French countryside making this super rich, amazing yogurt. They would sell in these beautiful little glass jars. That was YoPlay. So that's what they went back and recreated. They went back to their roots. Who is YoPlay? YoPlay is natural, rich, French countryside, creamy yogurt sold in a beautiful little glass jar. It tested amazing. It's in the market now and it's actually performing really well. It's not Greek yogurt. It's not, the, the name is not Greek. It's actually, they went back to their basics. They went back to who they are as a brand versus trying to follow a market. <laughs> well, maybe we need Greek yogurt. What, what do other people want? Instead of worrying about what other people wanted, they said, who are we? They created that product and it worked. People loved it. It's in a ton of stores now. The sales are going really well. Uh, you can read about it. New York Times actually did a great story on it as well. So again, an example of 
a brand who said, how do we embrace ourselves first and then bring that to market? Does that kind of unpack that centrally human a little bit more? Great. And so this brand brilliance review will help you do that. Secret number three using disruption to your advantage. So I'm kind of curious what, and, and I'll, I don't want to have to call on anyone, but when, when you hear the word disruption, what does that mean to you? Does anyone want to Cliché. share? Hmm? Cliche. Cliche, yeah. <laughs> different from the old Yeah. Nice. So if you ask big corporate, you'd probably get a negative connotation of the word disruption. If you ask the disruptors, it's, it's a little bit more, aside from the fact that it is an incredibly you know, jargon-loaded word now <laughs> and overused, you'd get a different take on it. You guys had a very much more, I, I, wouldn't, I would call it positive take on this word. Um, and when we talk to corporations, you know, it's, it's scary. It's a negative connotation. Either way, you can absolutely harness disruption to your advantage. So I have a client, they're in the medical field, medical technology, specifically MRIs. Um, and when they, they're mid-sized companies, so they're not a startup. They're, they're a decent size, smart choice MRI. They're in the Midwest. And they looked at the industry and they said, why does this experience suck? What? Why is getting an MRI so terrible? Why can't it be better? Why can't I get cookies? Why can't I not wear these terrible gowns? Why can't I go online and schedule my own appointment the same way I do with takeout food? And so they created this brand and this experience that completely is dis disrupting the industry. People are saying, yeah, why not? Why, why can't I have a better experience? I'm still going into the best in class machines. I'm still getting incredible readings. But why can't I walk into a nice lobby with free cookies the same way I do when I check into a hotel? And so that's a really cool example of folks like yourself disrupting industries that just hadn't thought about it before. Another example of disruption, Amazon's actually doing this. As we completely change how, we, uh, how technology allows us to, to really get to what we want at that point of need. So Amazon was looking through their data and they realized through the patterns that they could pretty well predict after you were browsing so many times when you were gonna buy something. And so have you heard about preemptive shipping? They started looking at different patterns and saying the likelihood that you're gonna come back and buy this is high, so we're just gonna ship it to the warehouse near you. If we're wrong, no big deal because you know the, the margin of error is slim. But if they're right, they shaved off all that time for themselves and the additional cost. Completely disrupting this idea of supply chain at a big corporate level. And the reason they did it is because they, they just started small, they innovated, and they said, why, why not? Why can't we do this? And so I bring this up not because there's like one magic thing that you need to do, but as your companies grow and succeed, you will be disrupted. <laughs> you will be the disruptors and the disrupted. And none of us can see what's coming around the corner. And so when we're thinking about as your, you know, the future of your brand and how do you really get in front of it and feel empowered to control it, there's a phrase called fortify and explore. Has anyone heard of that? So the idea is fortify around your business. You, know, you do you really well. Manage your cost out, keep your customers happy, really own what you're making revenue on, but also have a part of your business to explore. So understand what's going on in the periphery. Blockchain might not apply to you right now at all. We're not seeing a lot of applications outside of a handful of industries. But you should know in general what it is and just keep your eye on it. That could be an hour a week. It could be a person on your team whose job it is to be that periphery explorer. But just having that consciousness built into your business will allow you to be ready for the disruption when it happens, either for you to pounce on it and take advantage and say, you know, I, is, there, is the company that's in the media business here, a media agency? I'm not sure if they showed up. So if you're an advertising agency, blockchain might be a way to prevent ad fraud, is what they're talking about. Well, that hasn't really happened yet, but the first person, the first mover that does it, you can take that, see the proof point, jump on it, and take advantage of it. 
as an example. So that idea of fortify and explore, don't get so distracted with the unknown or so paranoid about you have to continue to be the disruptor. You know, as you scale your business, that's gonna become less important and more about watching out for the disruptors that are gonna affect you. But peel off a part of your business, understand the periphery areas that, are, that you're interested in that might affect you and spend an hour or two a week just staying in the know. You don't have to be an expert, just kind of in the know. This is a technique that they teach big corporations as well. You've probably already done it, but again, as you grow, shave off that time just to make sure you have a consciousness and an awareness of what's going on outside of your realm. My secret number four, there's a science and there's an art to marketing. And I know everyone always talks about the art and science. Um, especially now moving forward, the science, and, and we're all, I mean, who here would call themselves at some degree, you know, a data geek or a technologist or, or an innovator, right? So we're all kind of tapped in to the science part, and we all know that it's only as good as the data inputs that you have. And if the world is changing, you can't use past data to make forward decisions because it's not relevant anymore. It's not apples to apples. So that art piece is gonna become really critical um, an example I wanted to share is actually Domino's. So I have a, a friend that works at Domino's, and I was watching, you know, when he, when he went over there, I just start watching the brand and seeing what they're working on. And a lot of companies spend a lot, a lot of money. There's a whole industry uh, around display ads, right? And I, as you as consumers, I am not a fan of display ads. And as a former agency marketer, I was never a proponent of it. But it's, it's just, it's the science. You have your marketing mix model, you have TV, you run display ads to drive awareness, you've got search marketing, and this is the cycle. And you spend a lot of money. Well, ooh, those banner ads you see on websites. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the billboard, the digital billboard ads when you're browsing the internet that most of us don't even consciously register anymore because they're just wallpaper. So Domino's looked at it and they said, well, we can't prove, you can always make the math to prove something works. <laughs> but we don't know if this, I mean, like they, they put on their normal person hat, their human hat, and they said, I don't really look at display ads. <laughs> so let's just stop for a minute. Let's just stop them and see if it really, let's see if they actually work by just not running them for a little bit. And if we see a drop in sales, we'll turn them back on. What a common sense, like, no data would ever back that up. There's literally no data. There's actually an industry of people that will scare the heck out of you to not do that. <laughs> but they did, and it worked. I'm not sure if they're still doing it now because you're probably gonna go see a Domino's ad online, but that test worked. And they realized, oh, maybe before it mattered, when display ads and the internet was relatively new, but for our brand right now, this isn't adding value, and we can take that investment somewhere else. So that's an example of leveraging the art and the art and science to differentiate and push your brand forward. And I'm kind of curious, you're probably doing this today, does anyone want to share a story of how they've kind of harnessed the art or their imagination to make a decision that was completely like just a gut instinct? Or is there one that you're noodling on that you want to throw out and talk about? Mm-hmm. And they were talking about the importance of keeping art and science combined. Yep. And I don't know if I know, but it's all this leading research and all these leading companies are making sure that they've got artists and all the designing the technology. Absolutely. And so I just kind of took that, and we're doing these um, workshops here. So I'm with the uh, Chicago Blockchain Project, trying to make Chicago Blockchain get the world. Nice. So we have uh, monthly events here, and they've always been technology driven. And so this month's event, I've got a um, artist coming in who wrote a comic book on introduction to blockchain. And for every event, I'm going to make sure we have artists involved. So it's, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was so eye-opening. I was like, oh my gosh. Because they, they're the futurists. They're the people that yeah. bring all this creativity when some technology people like myself are going to get stuck on what we can do. They're the people that will stay the future. 
Yeah. Well, and what a nice, I mean, who wants to really read a white paper? <laughs> like, no, nobody. Like maybe the guy that's selling you the white paper tells you that everyone likes to read white papers, but I'd much rather download that. And, and that would actually teach me what I need to know yeah, kind of than anything this else. Is, this is how he's a storyteller. This is how he storytells. And when he learned about blockchain, he, all he could think about is I just have to write this down. So he just published it and he doesn't even have a marketing plan. He just said, I just had to write it down and now he's. Good for him. It. It's really cool. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And I, no, I love that example. And there's no, and there would be nothing to back that up other than this person saying, it works for me. I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm just going to do me. It worked for me, so why not? I hope we end up in a world in five years where we see more of that common sense decision making. I think a lot of things have been done because there was an ivory tower of people saying we should do it this way. For some reason, when we walk into work, we still completely lose. I don't know about you all, but um, I, you know, I walk into corporations and it's like, you would never do this in normal life. And yet you walk in here and we're making decisions that just don't make sense. So I love that example because it's like, yeah, we, we'd all love to read a comic about blockchain rather than, you know, e even some of the videos. Yeah. Your, your start, yeah, I would love to see yeah. that and we'll share it out. That'd be awesome. Thank you. And so that actually is a really good example that'll lead into kind of the takeaway for the secret. There's a science that you can employ. So really good test and learn strategies to help manage the cost of learning. Because that's the, the cost of learning is what's going to be the biggest barrier. So how do you make sure you're not investing in a lot of things that are gut feelings, that I think this is going to be cool and it doesn't work? So managing the cost of your innovation and learning through a test and learn strategy. I'm not sure if you all have, you probably have test and learns because you're you're start, you know, you're in that kind of that startup mode, right? Okay. So for a lot of companies, they have been doing them, but they're not formalized. There's no rules around all the if-thens that could happen to allow you to make that trigger decision when it comes. And so what I would say is if you do have test and learn strategies in place, make sure you're constantly evaluating what your rules are for your trigger decisions. And if they're pretty organic, I would try to formalize them. Um, one, because that's you formalizing your art into science. But also because as you grow, expand, and get you know, more people involved, empowering teams to know how to make those decisions. So when, when we hit this level of loss, stop. We can reevaluate, but pause. Stop spending money. Or when we see these indicators, raise your hand and say, we're actually seeing something that might be valid because we're seeing X trend. So formalizing that really, really helps a lot. I started out my career in search engine marketing when I was at a point where I was essentially training all my new Google reps how to use their own platform because it was so new in the industry. And so we had to really develop well, what is good and what is bad. And when you're running with mountains of data and a lot of money, at what point do you walk away? That, that's the biggest one. How, when do you know how to pause and walk away or pause and reevaluate? And so building in some of those formalized rules into your test to learn can help you manage the cost of learning and also validate art. Okay, secret number five, getting more with less. Uh, I'm kind of curious for, for the companies in the room, does anyone else want to share what they, what they work on or what they're doing right now? Sure. Uh, my company is called Changed. We're a mobile app to help people pay down student loans yeah. effectively using their spare change roundups from everyday purchases. If you guys ever heard of Acorns, we have a very similar uh, savings method, uh, but we take the actionable step to actually pay down your student loans. I like your website, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're still working on it, um, but I mean, the best way to explain student loans is that they suck. And no one wants to talk about them, um, and no one wants to really deal with them. People put it in the back of their minds. So we're trying to bring it forward. We're trying to bring a more positive aspect. We're trying to show the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and it's been great. I mean, I feel like we get people excited about student loans in a way. Um, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, nice. Does anyone else want to share? So, uh, 
Tim Cook, Apple, went through, uh, I made an interview a couple years ago, and I think this is a famous quote now, you know, every one of Apple's products can still fit on a boardroom table. They know themselves that well. They're that specific, and that idea of doing more with less. They don't have massive inventory. They don't have some crazy complexity in their business. You can put every Apple product on a conference board table. And so when we've seen, and then we, we talk about this shift from the digital to the human age, this idea of being centrally human, one of the characteristics is simplicity. And a lot of this did come out of um, a lot of dynamics that happened in the first half of the century, but especially the recession and the change in dynamics and expectations as individuals. So a power dynamic shift happened, and also technology allowed us to do some really cool things. And so I'll use you as an example, but there's companies out there that took that similar concept just for savings, right? And that's very broad, like, oh, we'll help you, you know, like for the round up the dollar and put it into savings. And what your brand is doing is taking that, that focused approach and saying, that's really general for a lot of people to still wrap their heads around, do it for student loans. And so that idea of everyone needs more focus, we've got so many options in the marketplace, we're seeing a massive trend towards specificity, highly focused products that solve a specific problem. Even though technology-wise, it, it, you know, you're like, yeah, you're rounding, the, right? you're rounding the dollar, you're putting it into account, once it hits a certain amount, it pays off, it makes the payment. It's not crazy. I was gonna say, we, had, we, had, we always thought of the option, well, we can set and direct all this money anywhere, it, it, truthfully, but what builds the most value to a customer, what builds the most value to a user, what makes them understand the product more, rather than giving a user 17 different options because they have credit cards or right. mortgage and student loans, I mean, it'd be everywhere. Maybe one day we'd expand in those avenues, but focusing, building the value with that specific that helps people understand the future. Yep, absolutely. So that's the principle behind doing more with less. It's really, really hard. It sounds amazing. And I think we'd all be like, oh, of course, like why wouldn't I focus? <laughs> it's incredibly hard. Corporations, so I've got a background with GE, incredibly hard. I've worked in agency land where I've worked with corporations from American Family Insurance, Hyatt Hotels, incredibly hard. I run my own business and I work with startups at 1871 and other organizations, still really challenging. It is amazing. I think we see the potential in the work that we do and, and wanting to actually do good in the world and we go, oh, but I could do all these things. But having the confidence and the discipline to say, I can actually do more with, a, with, a, with less, with a tighter focus. And so that's really the takeaway for this secret is having the confidence and using examples like Apple or like your company to say, I can do more with less. You were going to say something? Yeah. Oh. I do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, human, I guess, centered design is just like taking over. Mm -hmm. As much as we can simplify, serious, generally, and if you can define the methodology to simplify, as we were talking about, yeah, it helps a lot. It does, and it's. I mean, this is all plays on you know the nudge principle, right? It, asking people to take leaps is really challenging, but in the world that we live in today, and again, we talk about that shift from the digital age to the human age. We don't want something that's bright and shiny and overly complicated. I'm not impressed. And no one is any more really impressed with technology, right? We've got four-year-olds going and taking coding classes. Don't, don't flash your code around and think that I'm going to be all starry-eyed, right? Whether or not it's hard, we've got this massive amount of people just jaded in the world about complex technology. So that idea of keeping it simple, that's what makes it stand out. The fact that there's a problem that I have and you're solving it, that impresses me. So one thing, and I think the takeaway from here is you're thinking about the future of your business. As you create really simple focused brands, right? Whether they're multiple, whether they're within a portfolio, as the simplification continues to occur and the proliferation of, of niche marketplaces, we're gonna continue to see commoditization and a massive expansion of potential competitors. And so the, you're gonna need to develop uh, a, a competitor partnership strategy.
So cooperation with competition is going to become even more and more prevalent over the next five years, at least until we see industry consolidation again. But how to, you know, I don't really like the word frenemy because I think it is kind of cliche, but how do you figure out people in your marketplace that are tangential that you can develop partnerships with, even if they are traditional competitors? Because the reality is you can do more with less for you and then take advantage of this collaborative competitive marketplace because they're going to be doing the same and believing in the idea that there is no zero-sum game, that the tides do rise together. We actually do have a world of abundance. <laughs> so the, it isn't a zero-sum game. So when you create these productive and well-managed uh, deals with competitors, you can actually exponentially increase your business returns. They take a little bit of time and thoughtfulness when you're thinking about those revenue streams. But a lot of corporations now, I led this group at one of my previous roles, building out those, if you think about the Venn diagram that we did here in this workbook with your customer, doing that same work with one or two collaborative competitors will allow you to actually scale your business while not removing your focus. Okay, secret number six, first impressions matter. I think this is incredibly intuitive and yet as business people, so hard. I've got clients that say, well, I, I don't have time for branding. I just need to sell it. <laughs> That's the equivalent of walking in the room and, and like being just so obtuse and, and pushing yourself, the, the worst salesman you could imagine not taking time to introduce yourself, not taking time to, to learn who other people are, or have a conversation, and just go in for the hard sell. We've got limited time, resources, and money, but we can't overestimate the, we can't underestimate the value of first impressions. So I have a client, and uh, it's a global theater company um, specifically designed around education. So how do you bring arts, arts and entertainment, to teach younger people to help grow the industry forward. And there was an incredible program. It's, just, it's literally an amazing camp. The company's called Broadway Breakthrough. And he's brought together universities, top universities and decision makers from around the country that are gonna be in Chicago this summer. And if you're an up and coming performing artist that's thinking about college, you can get, you, I can audition in front of the, the decision maker at Juilliard. That's remar that is remarkable. And when he brought me on, he was like, I don't understand. This program should be sold out times 10. I, I don't understand what's happening here because it's just, the access is insane. And what we found is we were hitting them so hard with the sales. Sign up today, you get this, this, and this. And when we took a step back, and he talked with some of his past customers and clients. You think these are, you know, parents of kids who are in theater, so very active, active in the in the community. And they said, "Yeah, but we just didn't get it." Like I hear what you're saying, but like it took a while to unpack what that really means. And so with that learning, it was really we we rushed into it too fast. You've got to take a step back and do the work. You've got to do the hard part first, which is. This is who I am. This is what we're trying to do. This is why it matters to you. And here's how we're going to do it. There's going to be a camp. You're going to get this, 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 and this. It seems really simple, and he was already established in that community. But it's a really poignant story about how you have to take a step back. Never undervalue first impressions, even when you're upselling or cross-selling against an existing customer base introduce yourself again. Don't expect anyone to remember you, understand you, know who you are. Have that humility. And again, this is your brand being a person. This is your brand being a really genuine, authentic person to come into the room and say, listen, you probably remember me, but I don't want to assume, so let me just remind you of how we met and, and what I believe in. And oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you about this cool new thing I'm doing. So we made that adjustment. The program's going very well now. Um, it's an incredible program, but it's a really, it's just a really interesting story of doing the work in a way that you think is so obvious, maybe I don't have to do it, I don't have time to do it, it can't move the needle that much.
but human beings have that same expectation on brands now, and if they don't get you in that first impression, they're not gonna get you. I've had this happen across multiple clients, actually, when I've come in and things aren't working, they're not selling, and it really is those untangibles, and we can call this the art and science as well, things that you do that don't directly result in revenue actually can completely kill your pipeline because you didn't do the work in the beginning. Do you have any questions on that or examples of, I'm kind of curious, any examples of brands that you've seen where you're like, ooh, don't talk to me like you know me. <laughs> or brands that you think have done a good job that they've introduced themselves, as, especially on social media. You know, you, you get the, there's just an inundation of new things where I see commercials and I'm like, you did a really good job. Like, introducing yourself, like that was a fun video to watch. I actually really enjoyed that. Anyone have anything they can think of they want to share? I mean, I watched one today. Um, it really wasn't an ad. It was like, uh, that channel, What's Inside? Mm -hmm. That channel. Like they were, they were doing this magic chess board. I'm sure the company, I mean, the company gave them the chess board. Yeah. They explained what was inside, but they showed how it worked and like what was inside of it. That's cool. I thought it was, I was like, I'm going to get one of those. Yeah. My kid, he started with chess. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, not a toy. That's awesome. I thought it was a, it was a good use of another company's good use of a channel, another outlet to like explain their toy and get it out there. Yeah. Uh, Very cool. There's um, a company that is a Chicago-based startup, uh, Social Snacks. Incredible company. Highly check it out. The woman used to work at NBC that founded it, and she does work for large and small companies. Great pricing, actually. So if you need a lot of video footage, I'd, I'd check out Social Snacks, Tracy. Um, what she does, and I, and I completely agree with this, and this is what you were getting at, is informative content for consumers that, oh, by the way, you might be able to buy this product. And as individuals, and we talk about when you, when you look at your workbook, that, that Venn diagram, you're this much in my life. I want to learn something. What about me? And if I can buy that, great. But we're all smart people. The world's not early 2000s where we're just you know, figuring out the internet and, and understanding things. Like We're all pretty savvy and sophisticated now, and so are our customers. So how do you add value first? I call it putting your journalist hat on. Really be a journalist. Put that hat on first and, and trust that either through the video or call it at the end or something around it, they can know that it's something they can buy, whether it's a service or a product. So that's actually a great example. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Well, it's pretty cool, too. It's like a physical chessboard. Yeah, and they pieces unpack it. Yeah. Move. Yeah. You play, you can play, you know, play against the computer or whatever. Your pieces are physical. Yeah. Well, I was talking with someone in the, um, I gave a talk in Michigan, and someone raised their hand and they were like, I'm in the, the cardboard industry. I'm in the shipping industry. And they're like, what does this have to do with me? And I'm like, do you know how cool that would be to like see how cardboard is made? Like, I remember being a kid and watching the video on how crayons were made and going, oh, like, as an adult, Getting to see inside factories or getting to open stuff up and see how it's made is so cool. Like, paper is actually a booming industry because of how many cardboard boxes are going out and shipping logistics. And I was like, you, you don't think people would care? Because I think, I, I, I've never seen a, how car, and these boxes are pretty intense now considering everything we get shipped in. Like, you could do something really cool with that and introduce yourself and then tell me about how to buy it or what it is in a B2B world, but what a cool, what, what a cool way to, to introduce me to who you are is bring me inside the factory and show me. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say we're building something out of the cardboard. Like yeah. A castle or something for kids. And yeah, stuff. oh, that's a good idea. I was, Upcycling. Uh, I was gonna say, I feel like some of the best marketing is like, they don't even talk about the product. Um, they really focus on something else. And there's this always commercial, like the Tampax. Mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they have a hashtag, like a girl. And it's like very like empowering women and how little girls see themselves. Like they, if you watch the commercial, it's like, how does a girl run? And someone that's like in their 30s, you know, runs like a girl. And then like they ask a little girl, how does a girl run? And they're like very 
Yeah, they're like yeah. running. Yeah. yeah. So super, like very, I don't know. Yeah. Touching in a way and also very powerful and obviously it was always commercial. So. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think there's two parts of it. One, how do you differentiate in a, a very, super commodity product? Yeah. Like what is your value? And if it is to, to help women you know, be themselves in their everyday life, however they impact it. Um, but yeah, it's like the idea is that you should be able to you know, run really fast and not have to worry about this thing. Yeah. Um, no, I, I love those commercials. The Dove one, I didn't, I didn't show it in this, but there's a Dove commercial about how and Dove is soap. I mean, how do you, how do, how do you make soap fun other than like the standard like your suds in the shower? And so what they realize with Dove is very similar. When you search for beautiful woman, on um, like you know the the photo sites, you get sexy pornographic type images. But if you ask women, you know like beautiful women, they don't relate to that. So they found the back door, they hacked into it, they loaded all these amazing images of, of women athletes and women just being regular <laughs> people that we all see in everyday life and completely changed all the search results because Dove's whole thing is about being beautiful and, and, and taking back the idea of that word. So very similar and nothing to do with soap but it, it did have to do with their brand and how it made you feel and when you walk into the aisle you might want to support that. Secret number seven, harnessing the power of your people. Moving forward really over the next one, three, five, ten years, this is going to be more and more um, of a constraint for businesses. Not time, not money, people and talent. Is, that is your biggest constraining factor. I mean, who has, I, I know for me, it's always interesting when you're like, there's so many talented people and I need to hire someone and then you can't find them. Or you find someone you're like, how do I clone you? Because like this is what I need, right? So people are, are the biggest asset, the biggest constraint in businesses. So how do you harness the power of that incredible resource to help your business grow? And what I found is, and this is really interesting, this word innovation is it's such a big word. And businesses will grow through innovation. But that also doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you get, oh, just innovate. There you go. Just be innovative. You're welcome. Talk's over. <laughs> oh, if only I thought, if only I realized I should have innovated, I could have saved Kodak. Oh, like I'm sure Kodak was like, oh, really? That was the only thing you wanted me to do? So innovation comes through imagination and people. There's no magic formula. There's no be innovative, do these five things, and then you'll you'll have a you know a separate revenue stream, and you'll be able to monetize this product, and you'll enter this new market. So, what I put together is this kind of innovation matrix, and I'll get out of the way so you can see it. Um, but really, how do you take this idea of innovation and explain it to your teams in a way that helps them feel empowered and imaginative? to drive your business regardless of where that innovation takes place. So if you imagine this is a, a grid or quadrants, so you've got expansive innovation versus iterative, iterative innovation. You've got completely new versus optimizing what you already have. And then we talk about what you, each one of those means. So if it's new and expansive, you're really creating something brand new. You're potentially creating a new market, right? You're making the iPhone. You are like, holy crap, that doesn't exist. We've just developed a new market. Yes. Totally innovative, absolutely works, lots of money there. Takes time and talent, but that's innovation. On the other side, you've got someone that's coded an Excel formula that actually shaves an hour off your day in your business. You're running that report, regardless of that or not. It's not developing a whole new, it's not changing the world, but you're saving an hour of time and resource and you're helping share something that someone else is doing super manually across your business. I call that innovation. I call that innovation because I want that person to do more of that. And I tell them that's, that's innovation. That's an example where you show up to work, if you're doing something every single day and you figure out how to code it and you can share it with the team, 
That's innovation. That aligns with our corporate mission. We're going to do that. That's the expectation on our employees, to be innovative. I don't need you to make a new iPhone or a flying car. I don't need you to figure out how to scale hydrogen cars. I need you to save me 30 minutes a day so we can spend that across our team. So that's 30 minutes a day we can spend in a customer meeting or we can spend brainstorming with each other. Or we can take that same thing and then we're using our brains differently and all of a sudden we start connecting dots in other areas. And so harnessing the power of people is really about empowering them to feel good about their own potential and creativity and imagination and then building out a framework around these buzzy words that everyone wants to be a part of, like innovation, and saying, you're innovative because you took a process that we've done forever and you made it better for us. Thank you. That was innovation. That shift in mindset and how we think helps people really feel like they can continue to stretch and grow and really helps you take advantage of your resources. It's imagination that's going to scale over the next five years. Because we have hit a point where we've got open source code. We've developed a lot of the core infrastructures that we need. I mean, we're already scaling blockchain now. It's not we're making blockchain, we're scaling blockchain. So how do you use imagination to take that technology and apply it to other industries? That's gonna happen with your people. You know, I've got a, a friend of mine goes to China and consults with those companies because they have so much data. <laughs> Everyone uses their phone. They are, they are like name, email, device ID, and every purchase that they make from the cab ride to the clothes, literally everything happens on one device. Their ID networks are insane and they don't know what to do with it. Because if there's not a culture of imagination you can sit with an asset forever and, and have a hard time differentiating doing something, making money with it. So that's what's gonna change the world in the next five years is how do you empower your teams to use their imagination in a way that's gonna drive and innovate your business forward. And it can happen anywhere in the spectrum. I think people think if it's not over here, I can't do it or it's not worth it. And I would say this is gonna be more impactful. I mean, the same way that you did with your company, it was iterative innovation. Right? We have this thing, if we tweak it like that, if we just focus it, everyone goes, oh my god, I need that. <laughs> right? Like, I, I think it's awesome. I'm, I'm sharing it with a couple of friends. Um, but little things like that, that's what changes the world. That's what makes money. I've seen it with corporate clients and I've seen it with smaller clients I work on. It's those little tweaks and it's using your imagination to make people feel a part of your business. So I'm kind of curious as we wrap up, did anyone have a big aha moment today? Or something that they thought was really interesting? Yeah. So I just like last week talking with my partner about what we should you know, get out in this next building test. Yeah. Just a cool way to be trying to get out there. Yeah. Uh, add all that extra bells and whistles that we can tell to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you kind of like we, we're going to parking lot it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree with that as far as people want. Yeah, and, and, and just even, well, yeah, I think you're right. We like to put things in boxes psychologically. And if we can't put it in a box, we just <laughs> it takes longer. It's not impossible, it just takes a little longer. So do you feel like with some of these tips, and we'll call them you know, the secrets, that, that change might be a little bit more manageable with some of these strategies? Great. 
And I'm curious, and we can go around the room really quickly, or you could just raise your hand or, or shout it out. Is there one thing that you're going to take action on in the next 30 days? I'm going to have more meetings with my team regarding you know, our, our marketing and our human humanness, I yeah. would say. Because um, I feel like every time that I feel like we don't talk about it enough. <laughs> yeah. Nice. It gets fun after a while. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm at, the, I'm at ground zero right now, so like, I have a bunch of things I need to do, but sure. um, branding is definitely on, uh, you know, on my list. So I, on the next 30 days, I'll have to spend more time talking to that with my, my team as well, like how, you know, what our brand should be. Yeah. Is. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely if you if you read books or you kind of think about the traditional way, you start with the customer and then you do you, I would reverse that. Yeah. I would do you first. You could always go back, do you, do your customer, and then that, that's what the work book kind of lays out, and then do your overlap, and it'll be much more powerful and authentic versus come off. And I think innately sometimes it can come off as like, are you just doing this because you think I want it? Um, so unpacking, you know, that, that why do we exist, um, first is really helpful and hopefully that can kind of you know you don't have to follow that but you can be a guide to say let's do I'm gonna do me first and then I'm gonna do you and then I'm gonna find out when is appropriate that we connect well that's helpful to hear you say that because that's like initially that's where I've always been kind of like what do I want to do mm -hmm. um, but recently I've had a lot of conversations about like your market and like what's the market value of your market yeah so I was like where do I start <laughs> yeah it's it's a combination of both I would always say do you especially in this age where the expectation is to be authentic and if people find out that you've kind of been people please like you're trying to be an environmentalist but you have nothing in you at all that ever led you to do that it, it comes out right um, but there's parts of you that aren't relevant to your customers and that's fine they're, they're you, they're internal, they're for your team, they're for a future product line. Um, so then on, you know, when you do that Venn diagram in the middle and where it matters, that's where you can start to do that overlap of, just because this is me does not mean my customer cares. And how do we really focus on you know, being relevant for the person in the room? Great. Well, I shared with you the seven secrets. Uh, and you'll get this as well. Um, but I really do believe, I've, I've done these myself over my career, I'm truly passionate about it because I, I really want, as a consumer, I want a world where we have incredible products and companies that help us all move forward. These secrets can be applied to you, you can adapt them, you can change them, they're really yours to play with. But the goal is that the world is ready for your company. It's time. And so hopefully you can harness your soul for your brand's future. Thank you.